This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. A cattle market update with Livestock Marketing Information Center agricultural economist Tyler Cousins kicks off today's show. He discusses the consumer price index and what meat is being featured by retailers. Continuing the show is Kansas FFA State Officers Christian Pena, Cecilia Newby, and Sage Taves to tell listeners about National FFA Week, which is currently taking place. Drew Ricketts, K-State Wildlife Specialist, finishes the show with how prescribed fire is beneficial for wildlife. He also says what can be paired with the fire for the best result. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Monday show with a cattle market update. And this week, we're joined by agricultural economist from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Tyler Cousins. Tyler, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Shelby. Tyler, kicking off our cattle market conversation with what are feeder cattle looking like? Yeah, so looking at kind of that feeder cattle side of things, looking at the Dodge City, Kansas report specifically, uh, in general, overall demand was mixed last week as prices were slightly weaker for steers and heifers under 600 pounds. Uh, but prices were stronger uh, for those steers and heifers weighing, weighing over six to 800 pounds. But as we get to those heavier 800 to 1,000 pound steers and heifers, they were generally steady from a week ago. But looking a little bit closer at the various feeder steer weight groups, those five to six weights were down about four bucks from last week to 299. Six to seven weights improved about seven dollars from last week to 279. Seven to eight weight steers were five dollars higher from last week to 250. And eight to nine weight steers slipped about two bucks compared to last week to 230. And then those heavier 900 to 1,000 pound steers lost about five bucks from last week. Now, and that's on the feeder steer side of discussion things. But looking here at the feeder heifer sides, uh, those lighter weights, five to six weights, heifers increased about 14 bucks from last week to 281. Six to seven weight heifers were 244. Uh, that's an improvement of, of over four dollars from last week. Seven to eight weight heifers were about two dollars higher from last week to 226. Eight to nine weight heifers were steady at 214, and those 900 to 1,000 pound heifers were uh, 188 slightly higher than the prior week. Now, kind of switching gears and looking at um, a little bit different part of the, the segment there, the fed cattle side of things, uh, specifically the five area average live price. For steers and heifers, USD reported negotiated cap price, cash prices ranged from 175 to 183 with a weighted average price of 181. Uh, this is an improvement of about four bucks over last week's price. We're seeing uh, some pretty good strength here in this fed cattle price market, well, so, so a positive sign for producers. Uh, but if we look at this compared to last year, fed cattle prices are tracking about $20 higher, so for pretty significant improvement over the last 12 months. You know, on a dress basis, steer and heifer prices ranged about 280 to 290 That's about $7 higher than what we saw from last week's prices. So switching some of the discussion here, looking at the choice box beef prices, prices showed a, a steady to slightly weaker tone compared to last week. So at the start of the week, box beef prices were, were showing some strength, but as the week progressed, uh, those box beef prices moved a little bit lower. And overall, the week finished at an average price of around 294 This is similar to what we saw the prior week. So these mixed results that we saw from box beef prices over this last week were due to some strength in primal values, while some of the other the other primal values saw lower lower values. So specifically, some of the primal values uh, that saw some strength were on the rib, chuck, short plate, and flank. But we did see some some strength also in the primal values for the round loin and brisket. So strength in these primal values, specifically the loin, loin round and brisket, probably tied to some of the, the uh, demand just leading up to the Super Bowl, typical items that we'd see consumed during uh, the game. Um, overall positive signs in the, the cattle and beef side of things is beef demand is holding steady, with uh, which is providing some support for box beef prices, uh, along with feeder and fed cattle prices. Tyler, transitioning now to look at consumer prices and wanting to talk about the consumer price index overall, but then also a few broke down categories. Yeah, so, you know, looking at this consumer price index, you know, it's kind of a gauge and some data that we get the, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And, it, you know, specifically, it's it's a kind of some data information that we look at to kind of give us an idea of what's going on as far as overall meat demand and just overall inflation um, as it relates to the economy. And, you know, the kind of the big picture item that we look at from the CPI is the CPI for all items. Uh, you know, and this is kind of that me- big picture measure that they use for inflation. You know, it's the one that you see in the news headlines. And that CPI was uh, 3.1% higher than a year ago. So this rate is still above that target 2% inflation rate that they're trying to uh, to get us to. But um, I think compared to where we were a year ago of 6%, 
this is a significant improvement as far as, far as overall CPI goes for uh, inflation. Now, looking a little bit deeper into uh, some of the data and the information that comes out of that CPI report, we have some information that comes out just on specific food CPIs, um, and one is specifically called the food CPI. So looking at that, that food CPI actually saw double-digit inflation gains a year ago, but in January, that food CPI was 2.6% above last year. So a, a significant improvement in that food CPI. Um, yes, it's still increasing, but I think where, where we were sitting a year ago, uh, that's a pretty significant improvement. Uh, from those double-digit increases there. You know, and some of that data also parses out some specific other uh, CPI indices that they have. One is for on the meat side of things. You know, so this meat CPI kind of captures some of those price effects on the beef and pork side of things. Uh, and specifically, this meat CPI um, in January was uh, 3.3.5% 3 higher. So it, it actually did increase than what we saw a year ago. It was actually up 2% a year ago. So the meat CPI was the rise was was uh, not totally unexpected, um, as we've we've seen. This includes some price effects from beef and pork. Uh, we've seen some fluctuation in those prices over the last few months, especially on the beef side. You know, and and the all fresh retail beef price has actually been tra tracking in the upper seven dollar range for for several months now. Pork side, pork prices on the retail side have been holding pretty steady around five bucks for several months now. So if we kind of combine these two prices here, that kind of contributes to this overall effect that we're seeing in the meat CPI. And one of the other CPI indices that they report is a, a poultry CPI. And in January, this was up 1.7%, uh, significant improvement than the 11.2% the poultry CPI that we saw a year ago. Now, I think with this poultry CPI uh, index, we have to keep in mind that HBI has been an, an influencing factor on poultry prices in re recent months. Cases have ebbed and flowed over several months now. And so you know, some of these effects are, are translating back into this CPI index. But I think more recently, HBI cases have slowed somewhat. So I think this is a positive sign. We're seeing this poultry CPI start to moderate a little bit more. So we should see some some benefits there for the consumers in the near term at the grocery store, just prices for uh, poultry and uh, products in the meat case. Now, one of the things I want to point out on the poultry side of things is that these prices have been fairly stable, tracking about 240 to 250 per pound over the last 12 months. So I think we'll see some of these prices uh, moderate here and, and be a positive sign for more of these uh, price sensitive consumers in the, their grocery stores. And Tyler, as you're talking about beef, pork and chicken, what retail activity are we seeing for them? Yeah, so I think when we kind of look at the feature activity side of things on beef, pork and chicken, kind of what we're looking at here is just sort of a, some indications for overall meat demand. And one of the things we specifically look at that gives us an indication of this is a report that comes out of USDA uh, Ag Marketing Services. It's a weekly report uh, and they have retail feature activity reports that come out specifically for beef, pork, and chicken. They're their own reports. And these reports uh, can give us an indication into retail store expectations on potential consumer meat demand for beef, pork, and chicken. Uh, and one of those data points that we're specifically looking at is the uh, feature rate. Now, AMS defines the feature rate as the amount of sample stores advertising any reported item for that week. Okay? So, for example, when we're looking at the feature rate activity for retail beef, uh, this is typically around 70 to 75 percent for the through the first quarter of the year, meaning that of the stores sampled, 70 to 75 percent of those stores advertise beef for that specific week. Okay, so looking at this a little bit closer on the retail uh, feature rate for beef, pork, and chicken over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've seen that there has been a rise in feature rate activity, especially for chicken and pork. Now, this is likely tied to the Super Bowl. Uh, retailers are we're working to provide deals for consumers to purchase food items in preparation for the Super Bowl. So looking at the chicken feature rate, uh, we saw a slight bump to 63% compared to 62% the prior week. So a steady feature rate for chicken is likely an indication that retail grocery stores are actively looking to feature more competitively priced chicken items. In any case, uh, especially finger type food items like wings leading up to the Super Bowl. Now on the pork side, the retail pork feature rate was 73% last week. This was an increase from the 65 to 67 percent that we have been seeing since the start of the year. But this is a little bit lower than what we have seen over the typical years, which is typically around 73 to 77 percent. It's a little bit lower on the pork side, but nothing too radical there. But similar to chicken, the, the retail grocery stores were actively featuring pork in the meat case prior to the Super Bowl. Now, on the beef side, it was a little bit different uh, take there. Now, beef, retail beef beat rate has been ranging from about 63 to 71 percent since the start of the year. This is slightly lower than the typical 70 to 75 percent that we would see during this time period. But compared to last year, it's pretty typical to what we were seeing a year ago. Part of the feature rate activity for beef is likely tied to higher beef prices 
uh, limiting the ability of grocery stores to feature beef items in the meat case. But, uh, you know, regardless, grocery stores were still providing incentives for consumers to purchase beef items, which was partly linked to Valentine's Day, I would argue, just an opportunity for those consumers to consider purchasing a beef item, potentially a steak in the meat case. And so one of the things I kind of want to highlight as far as some other information that comes out of that is just some of the discussion on featured items that typically will show up in those reports. You know, kind of alluded to some of this feature activity being tied to the Super Bowl and Valentine's Day for beef, pork, and chicken. But specifically, you know, on the chicken side of things, this feature activity is, is largely centered around this finger food items that I mentioned for the Super Bowl. So things like chicken wings uh, were a lot, one of those items that was primarily featured in these reports. On the pork side, you know, similar chicken and finger food side of things, but we also see in some of these items be uh, cuts from the loin, picnics, and spare ribs. You know, but on the beef side, being a little bit more geared toward Valentine's Day, you're seeing some of the more items featured, such as ribeye steaks and tenderloins. But there's also some increase in features in ground beef, chuck, round, and brisket, likely for the Super Bowl. You know, so I think kind of wrapping up some of the discussion on feature activity here, I think overall meat demand seems to be holding steady, uh, given we're in the middle of the winter months. Um, now, as we move into the spring and summer months, as these approach, you know, we're getting, getting more towards this grilling season ahead. And so I would expect meat demand will likely increase and, and consumers look to spend more time outdoors and, and grill steaks and whatnot outdoors. Tyler, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us a cattle market update as well as talk about some consumer price index and retail. Thank you. That was agricultural economist from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Tyler Cousins. You can see information from LMIC by going to their website, lmic.info, which I will link in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our show discussing National FFA Week, which is the 17th through the 24th this year. And to talk about it, we're joined by the state president of Kansas FFA, Christian Pena from Sublette, who is currently an agricultural education major here at K-State. And he is also joined by the state secretary, Cecilia Newby from Labette County, who's majoring in animal sciences and industry. And they're also joined by state reporter Sage Tapes from Canton Galva, who's an agricultural economics major. Christian, before we start talking about what is National FFA Week, what has it been like serving as Kansas FFA state president? It's really hard to put into words uh, just how we, how it's gone. It's been an experience like no other, being able to travel across the state, meet with chapter members, meet with some officers, and then also meet with some business and industry people who help support us and continue to support Kansas FFA. We do a lot of different things throughout the year, and whether we're serving on a board or we're going to be traveling across the state for all of National FFA Week, uh, the experiences that we've had and that we're going to continue to have uh, is a, an opportunity that it's hard to put into words. Cecilia, in your position as state secretary, do you feel the same? Absolutely. Like Christian said, we get to travel across the state, meet some amazing members and everything that they're doing in FFA as they're growing, not only as leaders, but as agriculturalists as well, and just sharing their story about how FFA has impacted their lives. And Sage, do you get to help share that story as reporter? Yes. So especially if we look at National FFA Week, I kind of spearhead the social media campaign that will go up to really engage those members across the state that we all have the opportunity to meet and interact with as well as just supporters and friends of the FFA who are able to follow us on that social media platform. So my two teammates have mentioned the really awesome experiences we have. And along with their help, I kind of get to streamline that and show that to all the friends of the FFA. As the three of you are working to share FFA on the county, state, and national level, wanting to talk about National FFA Week and what is this week? National FFA Week has been celebrated for almost 100 years, and this year with nearly a million members in the FFA, it will be celebrated and of significance like no other. So National FFA Week takes place every year um, over the week of February 22nd, because that was George Washington's birthday, and we want to honor and celebrate the role George Washington played as a farmer. Um, But National FFA Week encompasses a lot of things. We have an alumni day, a day of service, a Give FFA Day, a National Wear Blue Day, a Day of Service. Um, And chapters also put their own spin on these things and celebrate things unique to where they are. But across the state of Kansas with our 13,000, we're eager to see exactly how they celebrate National FFA Week and even step into some of their schools and celebrate alongside them. Have you heard what some of those chapters are doing across the state? Yeah, we have quite a few 
um, really great things on the roster. I know that a couple of schools were going to have some barnyard Olympics going on throughout the day, a couple chapter banquets going on, and then we'll be able to go into some classrooms, present some workshops, really start getting members hooked on leadership and the idea of an agriculture career in the future. Chapters are also hosting breakfast throughout the week, whether that's just within their chapter. Uh, some are doing teacher appreciation throughout the week, and some are even going even further and doing community appreciation and helping uh, support the community members that have supported them through all their endeavors within FFA. You have mentioned Give FFA Day, and Christian, can you tell us a little bit more about what is that day? Give FFA Day uh, allows members of communities, businesses, and all sorts of like to come together and donate to the FFA, uh, which allows us to continue to build on members' experiences throughout the state. Last year, we had a record-breaking $18,000 come in that day, and this year we hope to shatter that goal again. And this is something that allows not only us state officers to play a vital role in the betterment of our young individuals' lives, but it also helps young individuals and chapters to grow and continue to find their way through the ag- through agriculture. This happens on Thursday, February 22nd, and individuals can give money uh, through the Kansas FFA Foundation's Give FFA Day portal. And if you have any questions about that, you can definitely reach out to us here at Kansas FFA, and we can help you get those answered. And as we're talking about FFA, often associated with agriculture, but why is FFA just important for everyone? I think that the best way to kind of display this message is through story. And I had the opportunity to see students in my school who had no direct ties to agriculture really flourish in the FFA. An example would be um, a classmate of mine who was really heavily involved and had, you know, just kind of denied agriculture education in FFA as it was going to be one more thing on their plate. However, um, after some long hours of convincing, decided to take that leap and ended up being a state proficiency winner in service learning and is now pursuing an education um, to work in healthcare administration after her SAE, which was hosting blood drives. Another example would be a classmate who also had no ties to agriculture education, um, but entered the ag classroom as a sophomore in high school and has now pursued a chapter office and participated in many leadership development events where he really found his footing in the FFA, who is applying to colleges for a degree in agriculture right now. So these are two students who had no agricultural ties, but they found benefits in very different areas of the FFA, one in leadership development events and one in supervised agricultural experiences. Um, However, they're both now set up better for what comes next, and that's really because FFA is a life-changing organization that instills a lot of career readiness in young people. As we're talking about FFA, what is your guys' favorite experiences within the organization? FFA, uh, we say it a lot, it becomes like a family, and while that may seem like a cliche, it really is true. Uh, These students find a family not only with their members, but with their advisors as well, and a support system that's going to long last um, outside their time in high school. They build a community around them when they meet individuals from business and industry visits, and then just truly uh, understand how leadership is changing the world and how they can do that um, as a student that's in Kansas and can take that to the next level. What are some ways that people can become involved in FFA if they'd like to be? Uh, for students, it's just as simple as uh, getting involved with their with their ag program. Some chapters are what they call affiliated, which means that if you're enrolled in an ag education class, you're automatically a part of the FFA organization. Or there are some chapters where you have the opportunity to either choose to be in the organization or to, to opt out of that. It's I highly recommend that all students uh, give it a shot, even if it's just for a semester, even a year. At first, I didn't know quite what the FFA was all about, but... Uh, With some help from my ag teacher and some others in my community, I was able to dive deep into what FFA is all about. And without it, I wouldn't be sitting here with my teammates today. And being able to just get involved with leadership and the agriculture in general is uh, an experience that I'm very blessed for. And Christian mentioned that the best thing to do is get involved with your local agriculture education teacher. And though um, we're working diligently to ensure that agriculture education teachers are in all schools across the state of Kansas and national FFA across the nation, I think it's important to note that if you happen to come from a school who doesn't have an agriculture education program already set in stone, uh, the best way to really encourage that is through student voices. Uh, Share your desire to be in the FFA and to be in agriculture education and the importance of agriculture in your daily life. If people want to find out more information about FFA or Kansas FFA, how can they do that? Kansas FFA has uh, a social media presence on Facebook 
X and Instagram, where you can find us. That's either KSFFA or Kansas FFA Association on those three platforms. But we also have a website that has a lot of resources, um, and that's just KSFFA.org. That will have resources about how to continue to serve in FFA past the chapter level, resources about how to become a partner of Kansas FFA's, and just a little bit about Kansas FFA's mission, vision, and our history. That was Kansas FFA State Secretary from Canton Galva, Sage Taves, and she was joined by Kansas FFA State Secretary from Labette County, Cecilia Newby, and State President from Sublette, Christian Pena. You can learn more information about Kansas FFA by going to ksffa.org. I will link it in today's show notes on actday.net. Before we cut to a short break, we're now going to be joined by Scarlett Maydinger from the Kansas Livestock Association to tell us about two Kansas ranchers that will be honored at the upcoming K-State Stockman's Dinner. Galen and Lori Fink of Randolph will be recognized February 29th as the 2024 Stockman of the Year. The award is presented at the Stockman's Dinner, which will be held at the Stanley Stout Center in Manhattan. Galen and Lori grew up on eastern Kansas farms, learning the importance of sound decisions in cattle judging, business, and leadership. That knowledge, coupled with their passion for innovation, is what built Fink Beef Genetics, a successful seed stock operation that uses technology, including embryo transfer and artificial insemination, to provide cattle that work for commercial producers. Starting by placing embryos in other people's cows, the Finks pioneered this approach, becoming the first in the U.S. to develop such a program. Today, they implant more than 800 embryos per year, host two cells annually, and offer more than 600 bulls each year through private treaty. Galen and Lori have served as leaders in many industry organizations, and Fink Beef Genetics has garnered numerous awards. To learn more about the Finks, register for the Stockman's Dinner by going to ksubeef.org and clicking on Events. The registration deadline is February 22nd. The cost to attend is $50 per person. The 111th Annual Kansas State University Cattlemen's Day will be held the next day, March 1st, in Weber Hall. A detailed schedule and registration information also can be found on ksubeef.org. The early registration deadline is February 23rd. I'm Scarlett Matinger. Once again, the K-State Stockman's Dinner is taking place February 29th at the Stanley Stout Center. And then on the following day, March 1st, is the K-State Cattlemen's Day that will be taking place in Weber Hall. You can find more information about these events and get registered for them by going to ksubeef.org. I will also put links to these in today's show notes. We're cutting to a short break now, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Monday show discussing prescribed fire and wildlife. And then to talk about it, we're joined by K-State Wildlife Specialist Drew Ricketts. Drew, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me back. Drew, why are we talking about prescribed fire right now? Well, I know it's pretty early for a lot of folks to be thinking about prescribed fire, but really the earlier we can start thinking about it to get ready, the more good burn days we're going to have to be able to take advantage of. And I think... One of the things that sometimes gets lost is the the fact that most of our modern research indicates that you can burn really any day of the year and still get the benefits to livestock production that we see if we burn, you know, during short windows during April and those sorts of things. And is wildlife something we need to be concerned about when fire is going across a pasture? It is. And there's a couple of different reasons that we should be thinking about wildlife when we're thinking about burning. And I think the most important thing is that prescribed fire is an incredibly valuable management tool for most of our wildlife species. And it's also the cheapest habitat management practice that we can do for most wildlife species. So fire is good for critters. Sometimes when we burn late in the spring or start to burn early in the summer, we do see some direct mortality of things like turkey nests, quail nests, our ground nesting birds um, can be affected. We can also sometimes see some direct mortality of reptiles. So somebody might see a dead box turtle or a dead snake and those sorts of things. And while that's not our favorite thing to see, 
I think it's also important to recognize that most of those species don't exist if we don't have prairie. And so the longer term benefits of a prescribed fire far outweigh any losses to direct mortality that we would typically see. And what are some of those longer term benefits? So um, I sort of alluded to one of those. One of them is just keeping prairie prairie, right? The, it, when we use prescribed fire as a management tool in prairie, it sets back woody vegetation. It removes some litter which provides habitat for different critters. So we have some species that that want to be out in prairie that's got a really deep litter layer, meaning last year's growth or two or three years worth of growth. And then we've got other species that like to be in patches of prairie that have been burned off this year and have been grazed really close to the ground. And then we've got some critters that want to be in sort of an in-between space. And having all those different types of time since fire and grazing on the landscape is really important for many wildlife species. And it's also important for plant diversity? It is, yeah. And especially when we couple fire with grazing, we see a, a, a big effect on plant diversity. But, you know, we can also see the benefits of a more diverse plant community just from one fire, even even if we're not grazing it. And so, you know, the more pretty flowers or the more weeds, as long as they're not noxious weeds that we see out there. Both of those groups of, of plants I would call forbs, so they're broadleaf herbaceous plants. Those provide valuable food and cover for many species, white-tailed deer included, but also all of our ground-nesting birds and even, even birds that don't nest on the ground that are in the prairie. And the, the forbs are really beneficial for providing food to young chicks, and that's because they they provide this nursery ground for insects and also other arthropods like spiders. And those food sources are basically all our young chicks are eating for about the first six weeks of life. And that's a really, really important food source for them during that time. Is there something that people should pair with fire to make it more worthwhile? Sure. So if we're in the prairie, you know, matching, letting grazing animals uh, interact with that fire after the really the after effects of the fire, the regrowth after the fire is really important. If we're thinking about burning the timber, sometimes we get that canopy that's way too dense. And so we don't get sunlight reaching the ground. And fire is actually most beneficial in the timber when we get the combined effects of the fire moving through, burning the litter layer off, and then the sunlight hitting the ground. And so all the new stuff that's able to germinate because we remove the litter layer benefits from the sunlight as well. Drew, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some information about prescribed fire and wildlife. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. That was K-State Wildlife Specialist Drew Ricketts. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow.